everybody. I am Super Julie Braun, and I am the founder and CEO of SuperInterns.com. And today's show is all about outliers, how Oprah, Bill Gates, and Steve Jobs leverage their internships, because we believe that it starts as soon as you start thinking about your career, that's when you can start becoming an outlier. And this show is really for interns and career seekers. If you're curious about how people became successful in their careers, well, then this is the show for you. And for business owners, if you want to know how outliers can affect your business or even how to become an outlier, um, my timer just went off. Uh, that would, you know, this show is also for you. And if you want intern interns or internships, you can always go to our website. Um, we have Teak, who is our uh, driver behind the scenes. He will be putting up all of our links throughout the show. You can go to superinterns.com to either get interns or become an intern, or if you need career advice, we also do career coaching for people who need that. So over in the corner, and I don't know which way to point, Robert, I'm going to go this way today. Um, there's some hands, and that's how you give props. And right now I'm going to give Robert props, exactly, to demonstrate that I like what he's saying, or maybe if he's quiet, I'll give him props too sometimes. And um, we want you to also tweet this to your friends and Facebook it to your friends. And that's over on the left hand side of your screen. You will see a place to tweet and to post to Facebook. Please do that so that we can get more people to come to the show and listen to what you know we're going to talk about, which is going to be a really interesting topic tonight. So um, let's go ahead and Robert, let's start off with you. So you are my co-host tonight and you're also my friend and you're also a client of superinterns.com. Uh, Robert Geller, who is the chief adventure officer of Outings and Adventures. Robert, please take a bow and, you know, and, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, um, I own a adventure travel company. We target the LGBT community which is a $70 billion a year uh, business as far as the, the dollars that the LGBT community spends on travel each year. And so our business targets that, that audience and we reach out to tour operators and we bring tour operators and the LGBT audience together and uh, on our website, which is audienceadventures.com. That's awesome. You have an amazing, very well niched business. I don't know a lot of people that can say you said it's eighty-seven billion. Uh, the uh, well, the, let's see. It was, a, it was the New York Times article in two thousand fourteen that put it at seventy billion. Seventy billion dollar business. Yeah. It's absolute or industry. So mm -hmm. when we think of targeting a group of people and niching your business and really understanding who they are and being able to serve them and give them products and services that they're going to want and love. Um, you, you know, you have an amazing business. I love your business and I love the community that you serve. Uh, Superinterns.com, we're allies and uh, advocates of the LGBTQ community um, ever since I was, you know, little. So uh, I'm really Thank happy to you. have you on here, Robert. Thank you. And, and at 70 billion, that's quite a niche. That's huge. Exactly. It's enormous. So, well, let's talk a little bit about the big idea, which is outlier. And I'd like to say uh, it is a sp scientific term. I'm reading this now out of uh, Wikipedia, a scientific term to describe things or a phenomenon that lie outside the normal experience. And um, I pointed to the book earlier, but I'm going to again, Outliers, who was written by Malcolm Gladwell. Fantastic book. Um, I don't know how old it is. It's probably maybe 10 years old or something like that. Uh, I have dog-eared this one. It's a newer copy, but I have dog-eared it and marked it up because there's so many great ideas in here. And one of the things that he specifically, Malcolm Gladwell specifically talked about was he wanted to understand how people thrive and become an outlier. And it's more than just working hard. 
because I think everybody thinks, well, if I work really hard, I'm going to be able to come become Bill Gates or Oprah or Steve Jobs. And there's a lot of other things that have to kind of align. And some of the things that he talked about is their family, their birthplace, and even their birth date. That one I thought was very interesting. Yeah. And so if we took Oprah, for instance, um, I want to talk about uh, close relationships. Now, uh, Oprah was an intern for uh, WLAC TV, which was a CBS affiliate in uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And she, you know, interned there and she was running and getting coffee and she was organizing and she was doing a lot of things. And then uh, later, you know, the irony of this, that was kind of like her first foot in the door was getting in to do this. But then later she ended up working for another famous intern, Steven Spielberg on The Color Purple, the movie The Color Purple. And so I think there's a lot of connections here, maybe in that. So, Robert, what are your thoughts on this so far? Well, it's interesting, interesting enough, uh, you know, if you look at anything that Oprah will, will endorse, uh, you, you see it take off. It'd be a book club or a weight program. Um, so uh, it's almost as if, okay, we have uh, Oprah Winfrey here endorsing superinterns.com. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that doesn't speak volumes for for internships right there, it, just that in and of itself. And I think also if you look at the, at her or at, and these other outliers, um, they're almost, they go into the internship as if they're a sponge. And they're looking to, and, and everything is taking place around them as a sponge, observing and taking it all in. And then, and then look what they've done once they've absorbed all that information, everything going around them. It's pretty amazing stuff there. It really is. And then when I think of, you know, how ironic or maybe not, because lots of people have internships, but then I think of Steven Spielberg as being another kind of famous person uh, right around the same time, around the same age as Oprah and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. They've all had internships and look at how they've leveraged them. Um, I don't know if you know the story about Steven Spielberg. I only know this because I did a talk on uh, famous people doing internships and how internships, you know, uh, can kind of, you know, help, not kind of will help your future career. And Steven Spielberg, um, he he didn't get into film school. I think he was denied like four times at USC or UC. No, I think it was UCLA. And they would not let him into film school. Can you imagine <laughs> how embarrassing for Can that uh, for, for for that college? I'm just you know how embarrassing. Like oh no, Steven Spielberg, he wasn't good enough for us. Yeah. So what he did is he worked his way onto a lot, and he spent a lot of time interning um, as a editor. And he got his SAG card from doing his first movie called Ambling, where him and his sister were walking down a road. It's really pretty bad, but it, he was young and it was one of those, you know, beginning stage things. And you can kind of see, you know, um, how everything that we do from the very beginning can really affect us. So... Anyway, well, I would love to bring on our spotlight guest. So I'm going to open up the seat and I'm going to invite Alan Carlson to come on to our show. So Allison, come, uh, Al, Alan, oh, there we go. Uh, here we go. I'm trying to get him and I'm accepting you, Alan. So awesome. Alan is coming on right now. And Alan is our former senior blogger extraordinaire at superinterns.com. And Alan, the reason why I invited you onto the show is because I see an outlier in you. Uh, you know, you're you're kind of on that edge. You're kind of a, a very unique individual kind of guy. Can you please introduce yourself to everybody? And um, and then I have a question for you. Absolutely. So hi everyone, my name is Alan Carlson. I am currently a student at Northern Arizona University here in Flagstaff, Arizona. 
I'm currently a senior and I am majoring in marketing. And so Alan, um, well, here's the topic. Now we're going to talk about Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs had his first internship at 12 years old. And what I love about this story is that he picked up the phone book because Alan, this is before your, your time. We used to have phone books where everyone's <laughs> phone number would be in this phone book in your home and you would be able to look in it and then, you know, find somebody and call them. Robert's laughing because Robert remembers this. Alan, you probably don't. Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you had to sit on a phone book as a kid, maybe in your booster chair. But people used to use these phone books. Well, here's what Steve Jobs did. He took the phone book in his town and he found Hewlett of Hewlett Packard. And after and he called him. And after a 20 minute, minute conversation, he convinced Hewlett of Hewlett Packard to give him an internship where he was going to be putting in and removing screws from computers at, a, at 12 years old. This is what happened. So the question that I wanted to ask you, Alan, because you are, you know, quirky and 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 interesting, and I think you're incredibly talented. You're going to go very far. When I mention Steve Jobs to you, what comes to mind? And tell us and share a little bit about your experiences too, as being an early starter. Okay. So when I think about that story and about Steve Jobs, I would have to say that something that comes to mind is that Steve Jobs was really a person who really sought out opportunities. And he, I would say he definitely sought out to open doors for himself. Um, I actually read this story. I have a copy of Steve Isaacson, Steve Jobs, and it's, it's a really good book. And I actually read about this story and, um, I just think it was so interesting. I guess it was before they had the national do not call registry where you could opt out of um, the phone book. But right. yeah, so. Um, Everybody was in the phone book. There was no getting around it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it didn't matter. I mean, if you were Hewlett Packard, you were going to, you know, if you were Hewlett, you were going to be in the phone book and he, I, what a smart kid, right? To think, oh, I'm going to call the president of that computer company and talk to him. I mean, talk about moxie. Where yeah, do you think cool. that comes from? <laughs> I think that Steve Jobs, he was just so fascinated with computers that, um, you know, he, he clearly had a really strong passion for this emerging industry. And so he just figured, you know, why not give it a shot? You know, um, why not try to get my foot in the door and create opportunities for myself? And um, it turned out that it actually paid off. Um, he was really successful at that, which is kind of surprising to think about, you know, in today's modern world. I don't think it would be nearly as easy to do that in this day and age. Um, but yeah, really what I would say is that you know, Steve Jobs, he was clearly, he was a very driven guy. Um, he had a very strong passion for computers and he also had a passion to succeed and a passion for perfection. And so um, I would have to say that, that Steve Jobs was really, um, he just, he was looking to create opportunities for himself and um, having an internship that young at 12 years old is really surprising but when you get your foot in the door that early, the better, because you only build upon your experience and you only network with more and more people like Steve Wozniak. Um, Steve Jobs met him at Hewlett Packard. So having an internship is really good as far as networking is concerned. Um, and just all the skills that you can pick up from having an internship really benefits you. I, you know, the fact that you brought up Steve Wozniak, I love that because I think that also demonstrates that kind of who, you know, and they became business partners, obviously at Apple. Um, but you know, that, that early relationship and that passion that you were talking about, you know, that he was so excited about computers, he was curious about them and he went where his passion was, you know, he wasn't looking for what was popular because way back then, I got to tell you, computers were not the hot thing. 
computers were for nerds, right, Robert? Uh, oh, 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 thanks. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't see. mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking that while other 12 year olds are having a lemonade stand, you know, as, as their project, here's someone going for an internship and they, wow, uh, what drive, you know, and, and self-determination there, that, that's just an incredible quality and look at it paying off. Absolutely. I think there's something to be said about that being authentic too, because back then, like I said, computers were not popular. Technology was not a hot thing. Being a nerd or a geek was kind of frowned upon or, you know, shunned. And now, you know, that's kind of come into popularity. So everybody wants to be a programmer. Everybody wants to be an engineer. Um, you know, people want to, to design video games. And so, you know, he had that authenticity to go where his passion was, where his curiosity was. Um, really, really great point. Now, Alan, I know you got to go. We, we probably have you for like four more minutes. So I don't want to um, totally you know, knock you off or, or, or make you stay too long. But is there anything that you'd like to share about your own experience as an intern? What have you gotten from it that maybe um, is going to help shape what you're going to do in the future? Well, I know for me personally, I'm a marketing major. And I know that marketing, I'm pretty sure it's the most popular type of business degree. And the thing about majoring in marketing is that when you graduate, over 80% of marketing majors have to start in sales. If you want to get a legitimate marketing job, you need to have some experience in marketing. Um, so um, having an internship with Super Interns really provided me with some of that marketing experience that I definitely needed. Things like search engine optimization and um, writing blogs as a form of content marketing to attract businesses. That's all marketing experience and that's really gonna help me stand out. I actually have a career fair to attend tomorrow and I'm really excited because now I have some marketing related experience on my resume and I'm really excited to see how that's gonna turn out for me. That's so awesome. I can't wait to see what, what you're going to create. So, um, all right. Well, Robert, is it time for a survey? Because I kind of feel like we've got a survey here somewhere that we should be cool. doing. Yeah, let's go do a survey. We have um, members of our audience uh, type in their answers uh, into the message box and our behind the scenes people will go ahead and tabulate it. So let's go with um, our survey is, would like to know from our audience if you consider yourself a future outlier or not. You can go and type in your comments on the send a message. And that is, do you consider yourself a future outlier or not? So, Robert, do you consider yourself a future outlier? Oh, uh, you know, well, that's well, you caught me off guard on that one, SJ. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not one, I don't like to toot my own horn, and I'm, I'm gonna be the, I'll be the last one. Um, but if I kind of look at my career path and where it's taken me, it's definitely not been on the on the common road traveled. Um, so I, I would probably say that I am I am uh, on that path of being an outlier. Yeah, that's awesome, Alan. What about you? Are you going to be a future outlier? Are you going to make my prediction true or no? I certainly like to believe so. Great. I like that. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So, okay. Well, Alan, if you need to go, we totally understand. Thank you for coming in, answering a few questions for us. We always need to get input from uh, our, you know, from, from our teammates and, and people who have inspired us. Um, certainly. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Good luck tomorrow, Alan. Thanks a lot. And thanks for having me. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So saying goodbye to Alan and kicking him off. There we go. That felt kind of fun. <laughs> I didn't know I could kick people off. Wow. Uh -oh. All right. So what's the, um, any, any ideas on the, on the survey? Well, we're seeing what's uh, quad Fatha is saying future already there. They were saying that about you, Robert. 
They already uh-huh. see you as being an outlier. Well, you know, there is something about what you're creating. You know, again, that target market that you have is very, uh, I think you're going to very well niched. You know, you love travel, you love activities. Um, you're creating some really interesting uh, travel for for that community, for your community. And um, anyway, I, I I think, you know, and it also, you know, as you know, as Jason's, I am a client of super interns and I do have, I do have super interns as part of my team, uh, you know, we, where we're taking our company in a totally different direction, where we're going, we're, we're trying to become a portal that is best described as a trip advisor or a Yelp uh, for travel targeted to the LGBT community. And there's, yeah. there's really nothing else like this business model that we're putting together. So it is, it is quite exciting. And if I look at other crazy things and businesses that, that I, I have done, whether it was um, the, uh, five retail stores over an 11-year period or some of the, the crazy antics uh, that have taken place over there. Uh, actually, one story I, I'm going to go and share with you, and this is, this is kind of a fun story, uh, a marketing story, where um, one of my retail stores was hit by shoplifters. And it happened to be one of the first weekends that I took a weekend off. <laughs> And of course, so I get a call from the manager. Hey, we got hit by some shoplifters. So I come to find out that the shoplifters were cross dressers. So I'm like, okay, how, what, how, what, what kind of spin can I have on this? I wrote a press release. The press release said with a headline, ugly women steal underwear. And, and let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. My store was boxer shorts. We had boxer shorts, underwear, lounge, or pajamas. Headline was ugly women steal underwear. It was picked up by every TV affiliate in the, within 24 hours. Wow. Um, ABC, NBC, um, CBS, UPN, Fox. It was picked up by CNN. It ran every half hour and then on the, on the paper as well. So um, I'm always looking for something different that's going to get some voice. So uh, I, I guess I'm kind of out there. I think taking that spin is a good thing, though. Um, I know uh, a couple of years back, I was approached by somebody, I don't remember who, and it was in regards to the viability of online education versus traditional education. And, you know, I probably got a, a, up off the wrong side of the bed that day. I was a little glib in my delivery. And I said something like colleges and universities, you know, all those traditional schools, they better have a wake up call because online education is here. And if they're not thinking this way, then, you know, they're going to go by the way of the dodo bird. You know, they might as well just be there with the dinosaurs. And for whatever reason, you know, maybe it was my snarky little comment or something. It got picked up by 186 publications. Wow. And so the next like month, I was just like my phone was ringing off the hook. People were happy. People were mad. I got new clients from it. You know, it was really kind of crazy. And don't get me wrong. I love educating and I love educators. And I think we need, you know, we need schools and universities. We need people to have a place to go to learn. But I think also you can learn online, too, if you don't have the funds, if you don't have the way, the means to do a traditional education, do it online. So there's something to be said about uh, taking that moment and twisting it. Well, uh, I think it's probably time for those of you who have just joined us. um, I'm here with co-host Robert Miller, uh, Chief Adventure Officer of OutingsAndAdventures.com. And uh, our last guest uh, just took off, which was Alan. But now the topic, by the way, is outliers, how Oprah, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs leverage their internships. So now I want to invite in Eric. So I'm going to invite in Eric um, Baker, who is uh, coming and let me get him. And Eric, you are on. Um. So Eric's coming on and we're going to talk a little bit about mastery as soon as Eric comes on, which is one of the keys of being an outlier. And I think it's really important. Very important. Hey, Eric, how hey, are you? How are you guys doing? 
Good. So uh, Eric Baker is our senior YouTube guru at superinterns.com. And Eric, you're also a bit of a future outlier. So um, can you please just introduce yourself? Tell everybody like where you are and a little bit about yourself real quick. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Eric Baker. I am currently in Central California. I uh, am the senior YouTube guru for Super Interns. I just graduated last year with a degree in communications from the University of Arizona. And I'm looking to get into marketing and social media marketing. Okay, awesome. So we were going to talk about mastery. And that's one of the keys to this book is mastery. Um, and Malcolm Gladwell talks about 10,000 hours. Well, 10,000 hours equals out to be, I did the math. I was just <laughs> curious. I wanted to know, what is 10,000 hours? And I got, I want to say around five, five years of 40 hours a week. Yeah. And that's mastery. And I think one of the questions is, um, how does it affect outliers? And, and, and how does it affect you and Eric, you and, and, and Robert? How does it, how does being a masterful, really, you know, make you reach and be be beyond what everybody else expects. So Robert, let's start with you first. Certainly. Well, you know, I also think when you're looking at that many hours to put into a project, uh, a passion, a craft, uh, many people are going to fall to the wayside. They're not going to have the tenacity to get to that point. Uh, and that's why I wonder is that these outliers do stand out because everyone else has fallen to the wayside. And I kind of look at, you know, outings and adventures. I started it in 2008 after being laid off from a corporate job and I remember at my exit interview the co-owner of the company I was working for said to me so what are you gonna do you know I'm like oh, I think I appreciate you having some concern what I'm gonna be doing after I leave here since you just eliminated my position but I said to him you know I have this idea and it is called outings and adventures and it originally started as, as a different business model um, and that, so that's going on it's going on eight years, going on eight years in May. And I look at all, all the hours that have been put into that, and it's, it's not, it, I won't say it's nonstop, it's just that if you stop, you're giving up. So it, it, it's that tenacity to keep moving forward and, and morphing as you see uh, the business, business climate change. Uh, I, I remember when um, my, my former career was in retail, and I had opened up my first retail store and the local paper had done a story. And there's my face with a caption below my face saying, my customer is not your typical mall customer. Well, ironically, two years later, my store was in a mall. And granted, when I opened up my first store, my vision was, was very specific. My stores needed to be on, uh, on the outside, not, not in a traditional shopping environment. But I, had, I was listening to my customer. What did my what did the end user want from my business? Yeah. Well, that end user was going to the mall, and that's where we did over nine hundred dollars a square foot. When we opened wow! Up the mall. So a, a big part of what I'm getting at is listening to the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, so often we have a vision, and we'll just stick to that with blinders when we're not listening to what the marketplace has to say to us. Well, I think all the time that you spent, you know, getting to your business to where it is. You know, you, you've now you are masterful in outings and adventures, and now you're ready to take your business to the next level. So, Eric, what comes to mind when I talk about mastery and um, how it really affects outliers? What 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 bubbles up for you? Well, you know, not being as uh, experienced as uh, he is, um, I, I just have more experience in witnessing masters, like watching them from a distance, especially in the the sports arena kind of, I usually tend to bring all my stuff back to sports, but I've, I've played with a lot of masters of whatever sport they are. And it's, it's amazing to watch them go through the same motions that you're going through because they're not surprised. They know what is happening, what will happen. And, and just, there's no speed bumps in the road for them. They, they see it happen. They know it's going to happen again and they just move on. They know how to dodge just like that experience of, like you said, 40 hours a week for five years, they've seen yeah. everything. 
They know how to adapt to everything and nothing phases them. It's actually 4.4 years. I went and did the math, so I figured it out. So it's, you know, it's 4.4, not five. So, you know, those of you that are very particular, but you brought up something, Eric, that um, I marked in my book actually about sports in particular, which is an awesome example because I think what people that are masterful in sports, what they do is they practice. They're constantly practicing. And um, Malcolm Gladwell said it in here. Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. And that really rings true, I think, when we think of mastery and how long it takes to become really great at something. Well, now, Eric, you're an athlete. So um, you've been you've spent a lot of time practicing, you know, sports. Tell us a little bit about that. How many hours have you put in in sports when you just think collectively since you were a little kid? Uh, from when I was little, um, tons. Uh, yeah. Like it didn't really hit peak until college when uh, I was playing rugby and doing track and field simultaneously. I had something like. 12 two hour practices a week. Wow. And that was, it was just almost constant practice all the time. And then a sprinkling of school in there. <laughs> and do you feel that you're um, at, you know, that that's helped you get to where you are as far as your game and the way you play and the way you approach sports? I mean, what, what have you gotten from all that practice beyond becoming very good at the sport. What else have you learned from that? Um, I've learned um, the kind of thing I, I tell myself a lot. It's kind of, it's kind of a motto, but kind of just how I do things. It's um, because in every sport I've ever done, I've never been the fastest. I've never mm -hmm. been the strongest. I've never been the est of anything. Um, <laughs> but the one thing I could always do was I could take the pain longer than anyone else. Wow. So if we are doing a sprint, they may beat me on the first one, but I'll yeah. beat them on the 40th one. Wow. And I will destroy them on the 60th one. So it, <laughs> it, it was always kind of like the thing, like, don't worry that they're ahead of you now. They're going to slow down. You won't. I would like, I just would not let myself slow down at all. And oh my gosh. You, you just hit on another one of the topics that I, that I want to mention. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of jump forward a little bit. And that is, you know, outliers have all these qualities, but you taught, you tapped into my favorite one, which is grit. And that's for the people that just like, they're, they're, uh, they just don't give up. You know, the tenacity. Um, I, I got a really good uh, comment from one of my mentors. I asked him, he has, you know, five businesses, five corporations and a foundation. And he's, you know, my billionaire friend, uh, mentor anyway. And I have always asked him, you know, in your worst moments, how did you keep going? And he said, I'm too stupid to give up. <laughs> <laughs> which always just makes me laugh because I think it talks about the level of tenacity and, you know, that, that giving up would be very easy to do and maybe smarter people would give up, but because there's such a passion involved there, that grit. Um, but that, that is awesome, Eric. I'm going to steal your est. I've never been est of anything. I'm going to steal that and Facebook it. It's awesome. So, uh, all right, uh, Robert, what about you? Um, you know, I, I've always been from the mindset that um, I don't take no, and I just I keep going, and uh, up to a fault. But um, I, I, you know, whether it's with my retail store concept that I had, or it's now outings and adventures, or if it's any consulting that I'll do uh, with a client, it, it's. It's just you have to believe in it and you go. You just keep on going. There, there's the, Stopping and, and quitting or giving up, that's not an option. It is not an option. We have a really great question here from Kathy Wampus. 
Um, how do you hone the one thing to work on and develop 10,000 hours on? Robert, you want to take that one? Wow. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I'll use an example of uh, on, on my retail stores and, and, and it goes to what your, where your passion is. And for some reason, retail was in my blood. And uh, I remember um, I was working for a retailer and it was my, my mentor, Stacy Wagner, this, this woman was uh, instrumental in, in my, um, in my business career in, in retail as well. And she tells me this story to this day. And she tells me this story and I, whenever I see her and I shake my head in disbelief that this actually took place. But she tells me that on my very first day of this new job, her is my boss. I tell her that I'm only here to learn as much as I can so I can open up my own business. <laughs> and, and I don't recall her saying that, but it was for a retailer, the uh, Federated Department Stores. And I think two years later, I opened up my first retail store and there was uh, four more followed it. Uh, How awesome. I, I, I don't recall saying that, but it was just retail was in my blood and yeah. that's what just... I was passionate about that and I wanted to continue down that path. And there was, I was not going to stop whether it was, whether it was going to the small business development center to learn how to do a business plan and just learning everything from scratch. I remember one of the books that was instrumental in as well was guerrilla marketing and yeah. reading that from cover to cover. And that's where that, that, that story I told earlier about ugly women stealing underwear that right. from guerrilla marketing, how you can take, Take a situation where you might have a few dollars and a very soft voice, and how can you amplify it? And that wow, that is such a great story. Um, she probably was also thinking ass <laughs> when you said, you yeah. know, I'm I'm here to learn and you know, and, and and you know, start my own business. She was probably thinking, yeah, you ass, um, but. But you had said, and actually, and Eric had said something earlier too, uh, uh, just kind of glossing over failure. And uh, I love this because I heard it just the other day on, on on a television show talking about failure. But then I'm also, again, I'm still referring my book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, and that is we prematurely write off people as failures. We are too much in awe of those who succeed and far too dismissive of those who fail. And most of all, we become much too passive. We overlook just how large a role we all play. And by we, I mean society in determining who makes it and who doesn't. So, you know, when Eric was talking about grit, you know, that's one of those things that we can't really listen to the haters. We can't really listen to the people who are saying, oh, you can't do that because... Um, we all will have challenges that rise in our lives that we will have to overcome. Um, Eric, have you had any challenges in your life? Um, a couple. <laughs> what would be a good one to share? Um, well, I think the one that is probably the most beneficial that you're kind of nudging at um, is... When I was a senior in high school, I did end up getting into an accident and broke my neck. So I am about, I'm, I'm paralyzed from about the chest down and my hands kind of don't really work that well. But um, like even that, like that sucks. Um, but then I ended up within two years, um, got myself completely independent and got to college and started playing sports again for the University of Arizona. And that was probably like the biggest milestone, I guess, challenge I've overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And what and what sport are you playing now? I love hearing this. Um, wow, what sport am I playing? Okay. Um I am I play wheelchair rugby. I'm going up to Boise, Idaho in three weeks to play wheelchair rugby. Um but I also, in four weeks, have a half marathon that I'm doing. In wow. Yeah. So that going back to grit, 
you know, you have to have that. That's why, Eric, it, it's no surprise that I chose you to come on our show today and to be in our spotlight guest, because I think you really demonstrate that, you know, to, to a lot of people. Let's answer Ka um, Ka Caddy Wampus, um, her question I, or his question. I don't know who that is. Um, so how do you hone in on one thing? And uh, I think it really like put your ass where your heart is. So if your heart, if you get all excited about people, then put your put your body in a place where you were working with people. If you get excited about uh, cooking cup or baking cupcakes, go get yourself into a bakery. If you get excited about uh, Rosie Greer is really is a story I love to tell. Rosie Greer is a, a football player. Um, he was part of the fearsome foursome and he was this big hulking guy, um, just enormous and, you know, had that very scary him and his three uh, uh, brothers on his team. Uh, they they really changed the face of football. Well, after he finished football, he went and started needlepoint. So here's this big hulking NFL player, you know, and he goes to, to, to teach other people about needlepoint. This, again, this is being a, authentic again. But the story is, you know, he loved needlepoint so much that he was doing it in his free time. He was doing it in the locker room. He was doing it when he was uh, bored. And he would pull out his needlepoint and he would say the reason why he loved it so much is because he could demonstrate creativity. It was pretty. It felt good to his hands. It was, uh, you know, his artwork and it calmed him down. So whatever you're interested in, whatever really gets you, you should put yourself and then just completely dive into it. And whether it's an internship or taking online classes or going to a meetup.com group and, you know, sharing your interest and passion there, um, the, the 10,000 hours will happen very fast, especially when you do something that you love. Robert, you look like you have something to say. Yeah. And well, you know, and I also feel that those 10,000 hours, they're, 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 they're cumulative in the sense that your direction might change. Your your passion, your your drive in an area is gonna be one thing, but then you know what, you're gonna see something else that might take you, you know, a little bit over to this way. And then so the, it might not be that one thing that that ten thousand hours are on that one. However, it, it's gonna take you in a direction where cumulatively you've you've put in you've put in the time. Awesome. So I think it's time to do another survey. I'm dying to know. At what age did you uh, know what you wanted to do in your career and how long have you been working on your mastery? So, Robert, let's start with you. I mean, at what age did you know that you wanted to be in business? Were you like one of those little, you know, those little 12-year-old uh, kids doing lemonade stands or no? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you were, okay. Mowing lawns, babysitting, um, Putting together a carnival in the neighborhood. Um, I mean, what? Yeah, I, I was doing it. I was doing whatever that might that thing was, and uh, whatever. It's not that it was like you know always flighty changing, but it's like okay, wherever I saw an opportunity, and uh, so it's kind of just you know seeing what the passion was, but also seeing okay, I see an opportunity here in, in, in this particular market, and that's something I'm interested. In. I'm going to go ahead and go in there and, and carve out my own little niche. And that's happened multiple times through, through my career. Uh, one of them was, um, oh gosh, the, I actually haven't shared this with you. Um, at age 18 was my first company. And at age 18, I was a fashion designer. And that started with, I was into drawing and sketching. And what I did was that I opened up the Sears catalog for, so, for our younger audience, but back in our shopping days, uh, we shopped from a, a catalog that was this huge, huge, thick book that had everything that Sears carried in their stores. And I would sketch women in bras and I would turn that into a bathing suit or turn it into a dress or whatever. I learned, that's how I learned 
how to uh, sketch and put proportions together. So from there, I started sketching and then I became a fashion designer at age 18. So it's kind of following that passion. It looks like Eric has something funny to say. Eric, do you have some funny yeah. comment to say to Robert? I just get that feeling. I don't know. Well, no, I'm, I'm just kind of laughing to myself because when I was 13 in the Sears catalog, I wasn't really sketching the girls in bras. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so the show turned. Yeah. <laughs> people. I... It's a good thing you like me, SJ. <laughs> Boy. Well, I mean, he, you, crack, you totally cracked me up. It's very funny. So, uh, Eric, what about you? I mean, were you the kind of kid who, you, obviously, you were in sports since since you were little. So, was that really your focus? And is that going to continue to be your focus? Um. Wow. Okay. Voice crack. Okay. Um. Sports was kind of just a thing I did. Like it wasn't like um. Like. I I love this and I want everything about it. It was just something I'd always done forever and ever and ever. Um, but I think when like I'm thinking about like a career, like marketing, I didn't know was a thing, and so I fell into my um, first internship, which was with my uh, university, University of Arizona, the summer before my senior year, where I was going to be in Tucson for the summer and I was just asked around was, does anyone need any help? And the marketing team was like, yes, please. We have like everyone on our team graduated. So there's two of the seven of people that are supposed to be here. Please come help us. And wow. I was like, awesome. I'm game. And I jumped in and I was like, this is kind of fun. Cause the first week I started on, they had me write an email that I was going to go to, every faculty member and every staff member and every student that was going to be in the dorms next year. And I was like freaking out writing this email. Cause I was like over like 5,000 people are going to read this email. I better not mess up. And like that pressure was really, really cool. Um, but thinking back to like childhood, um, I think I, I made a joke to get into the communications major was that I was doing a micro PR since I mm -hmm. was born. Cause I'm, I'm the youngest of four boys. And, um, so I had a, a little thing I would do because again, I was never the ist. I wasn't the strongest, the fastest. I was, I was the smallest, I guess that's my ist. Um, but I would, um, make my brothers pick fights with each other so my parents would focus on them so I can get away with whatever I wanted. So, <laughs> so, so you were the craftiest. I was the craftiest. I, the I, craftiest. I, called it, I called it micro PR because I would craft messages with a specific purpose to get my brothers to fight each other. Wow. I see over here that Greg inspires. Um, he said at age 13, he was working on his mastery. I'd love to know, Greg, can you type in uh, what it is that you do? And, you know, age 13, what were you doing at age 13? Meanwhile, I'm just going to let everybody know um, our show today is Outliers, How Oprah, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs leveraged their internships. And I'm with my co-host, Robert Geller, who is the uh, chief adventure officer of outings and adventures. And we also have Eric Baker sitting in the, uh, we won't call it the hot seat. We'll call, it the, we'll call it the spotlight. He's our spotlight guest tonight. And Eric is our senior YouTube guru um, for superinterns.com. So it's always great to get a younger person's perspective. Um, okay, great. Well, let's move on to the next thing. And now let's talk about Bill Gates. So Robert, you've, you've got some uh, ideas about Bill, I remember. Uh, can you kind of refresh well, my memory and share a well, little bit? At, he too was an intern. Uh, as, as, a, as a high school junior, he spent his, his summer in, in Washington, D.C. as a, um, a congressional page. And uh, his responsibilities uh, included delivering messages, uh, preparing the House Chambers each day session, and performing other uh, activities for the administration or administrative tasks as, as well. So uh, 
that was Bill Gates's internship. That's great. And years later, when he was uh, talking to uh, the Senate or, you know, I don't know, one of those congressional hearings about the monopoly of Microsoft, he kind of commented back to his internship and he said, yeah, I'm not really meant for politics. <laughs> so sometimes you learn what you shouldn't do in an internship. And I, I think that will also help you, too. So how do you think his internship helped him become an outlier? Eric, let's start with you first. Um, it probably right off the bat, he knew he narrowed it down that he wasn't going to be working in politics or law. But right. he did learn from those individuals what it is to be a leader as well as a um, just a, an, an opinion setter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Robert, what about you? Well, you know, actually, what Eric just touched on there was a little bit of, um, I think it's just as important, or even more so, knowing what you don't want. Um, you know, I, I think so often uh, we, you know, we we're trying to figure out what we, oh, I have to find my my niche or find my passion, find my, uh, also the answer is what 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 don't we want to be a part of or what, what is not of an interest. Um, I think that is extremely important since we know, we know what our strengths are but recognize what you don't want to be a part of, what really is not where your passion is, so that you're focusing on, on really uh, what is the, the driving motivating factor for you. Definitely. Uh, I'm going to ask Teek, uh, our driver behind the scenes, to put up a link. We have a link of 25 famous people who were interns, and it's a pretty powerful video um, to watch because I think when you see it, you're going to see really two different groups of people. Um, one group that is probably closer to, to my age, Robert's age, you know, kind of in that arena, that the, the wonderful age. And yeah. then there's another group of people that are probably closer to Eric's age, but it's a very interesting dynamic between these two groups of people and their interests, what they've done and how they leveraged those. So let's talk about uh, another big idea. There seems to be something about vision with outliers, and that's that they want to create something better than either it hasn't been done before or, you know, they want to change it. So I think of the Google boys, be a good example, Larry and Serge at Google, you know, the founders. Um, there was already search engine. I think it was Yahoo. It was the biggest thing on the internet. And yet they kind of like went in and created something better. Um, so we talked, we started talking about the three qualities that outliers need to have. Um, we know grit's one of them. Robert, Eric, anything else bubble up for you that you think you have to have in order to become an outlier? I, I'm going to go and jump in. I think it's thick skin in the sense that you're going to have naysayers and that people that are not going to believe that are that are going to want to cut you down and you really need to stick to stick to that vision um, and, and that that's that's where that tenacity that thick skin because um, if, if you look at any of these outliers how many people you know I said Oprah I mean a, a woman of color to do what you, you think you're going to be able to do um, or to any of these other outliers, you know, how many people are on the sidelines were just just there to, to beat to beat them down and tell them no. Eric, what about you? Um, I I think what you said before is a really strong one, vision. Um to, mm. to a either um look at an industry and see a gap in vision. Like like a, I mean not a gap in vision, but a um like kind of like a, a gap in industry, such as like um, Elon Musk does a lot. He'll look at a, a huge industry and be like, oh, we're not doing this. He'll do that. And that's where he'll succeed. But also a vision for the future. So um, like Steve Jobs, you mentioned before, like he so often will put something out. Everyone will say, no, that's terrible. Like, um, like, um, like the iPad, when the iPad came out, everyone was like, that's stupid. That's going to be the worst thing ever. And it was the fastest selling commercial product in history. So it's just, yeah. it's just like to have the vision to know 
what's missing and what will become important. I think, I think that I, I think vision uh, is so powerful about becoming an outlier. I also think mentors and who you know is another important factor. Um, I'm just going to pull out my book again because there was something in here uh, that that struck me called cumulative a cumulative advantage. And I don't think we really, you know, like very often when we hear about an outlier, we hear how hard they work and, you know, maybe they came from uh, very marginal beginnings. When I think of Oprah, I think, you know, she she grew up very poor. She didn't really have uh, a family. Uh, you know, as far as I know, her her father was non-existent. Um, th there were a lot of things in her environment that were not great. And yet she overcome she overcame these and one after another, but she had mentors in her life. When she went to school, she started developing uh, mentors. She developed mentors throughout her entire young career. Uh, one of her mentors was um, Roger Ebert, who she dated for a while. And he gave her some of the best advice that he could. And that was for her to syndicate. Um and but she also always had the vision of creating something that was going to be different from everyone else because everyone else was doing very salacious television. There was like Donahue and uh, Geraldo and Jenny Jones and who oh. are some of the other ones that you can think of? Robert, you could probably think of more. Oh, Sally, people. Jesse, Raphael. Oh, yeah. That was another one. You know, there were all these people and they were doing salacious television, and she came to the conclusion that she was just part of the masses. And so, Eric, what you were saying is finding, you know, finding the need. And she decided that she was going to create a show that was going to be for the betterment of human beings. And so I think when she kind of took herself out of that element, she created something better. She had a bigger vision. Uh, you know, that just, again, rounds out being an outlier. Well, um, I, you know, we've got three minutes left, so I think we probably should, you know, close. If did you guys have any questions, any questions for me or each other? Now would be the time to do it. And then we're just going to jump right into saying goodbye. Uh, Robert, any th last thoughts, Eric? Um, you know, actually, you know, Eric had touched on something that was that you know, these outliers are looking at the marketplace and looking for gaps inside the marketplace that they can go ahead and, and you know, we'll use the word exploit, but there's, there's opportunities, probably a more positive word, but looking at gaps that others are, have overlooked and that have then taken that gap and made a, a huge opportunity in business out of that. Yeah, yeah, you're like, uh, Robert, that's exactly what you did, right? With Outings and Adventures. You you saw that gap and you seized the opportunity. I did, and, and I really, mine also came from, I saw something that I personally wanted. I didn't see it exist out there. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I have to create it myself. And boom, that, that's, that's really what I went in and did. So awesome. So interns and career seekers, I guess the question is, what are you going to do to become an outlier? And business owners, don't you want an outlier on your team or don't you want to become an outlier? So I'd like for you to think about it. Uh, I just have to thank Robert and Eric. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. Connect with these guys on Twitter. You can all find them on Twitter because their information is right there in front of you. So follow them. And uh, if you want to connect with them, that's the way to do it. And then, Robert, also, uh, people can go to your website, which is outingsandadventures.com. Correct, yes. Antique, if you could please put that up, that would be awesome. Uh, finally, next week's show, it will be the same place in the same time. And the topic is going to be six ways to make yourself indispensable to employers. So if you are a career seeker and you're wondering, you know, how can I – not only get a job, but be indispensable where I'm going to get promoted and people are going to come to me for my advice and they're going to love me and they're going to want to, um, you know, give me more responsibility and pay me more money. When you become indispensable, that's what happens. 
this is really going to be the show for you. And if you're a career seeker or business owner, you're going to want to come to our show. Um, I, I'd say we're at the end. So we should probably say signing off from superinterns.com. Have a super day. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm going to stop our recording now.